All right, so... <laughs> Uh, so this then is Scratch, a graphical programming language from our friends down the road at MIT's Media Lab that indeed some of you might have used in grade school or the like for playing and writing code and the like, but you maybe didn't necessarily think about how some of these primitives ultimately worked. And in fact, everything you've done, if you've used Scratch before, and everything you'll see today is going to apply to all of the weeks to come as we explore these things called functions and loops and conditionals, Boolean expressions, and more. With Scratch, because it's so graphical and animated, can you create, can you create Create animations like this one, interactive art and software more generally. But you'll do so by dragging and dropping puzzle pieces that only lock together if it makes logical sense to do so. And what you won't have to deal with in this first week of class is curly braces, parentheses, all of the weird symbology that you might recall seeing when we just wanted to say hello world. Now, this particular program. Um, Raining Men was written by a former CS50 teaching fellow, Andrew Barry, who's actually now the general manager of the Cleveland Browns, the American football team. And so these are just some of the programs that some of your predecessors in the class have created. And you'll see in the remainder of class here a couple of others as well and more in the course's first assignment, namely problem set zero. So how do we get there? Well, first, a quick tour of what it is we're going to do. This in Scratch is perhaps the simplest program you can write. And even if you've never seen Scratch or any programming language before can probably guess that this just says on the screen somehow, hello world. But what you don't have to do is type esoteric commands and weird syntax, those curly braces and parentheses I keep alluding to. You just drag this yellow puzzle piece, you drag this purple puzzle piece, let them magnetically lock together, so to speak, click a button, and boom. With those same building blocks and several others, can you make what exactly the sorts of things that Andrew brought to life as well? So here's what we're about to see. At scratch.mit.edu is a cloud based programming environment on MIT servers. You can also download it offline on your own Mac or PC. And it gives you an interface like this.、Uh, on the left hand side of the screen, you'll see a blocks palette. These puzzle pieces, aka blocks, come in different colors, which rather categorize them. So, pictured here, for instance, in blue, are a whole bunch of motion related blocks. So, Andrew used a whole bunch of those to have the singer and the men moving around on the screen、um, in synchronicity with the song that was playing in the background. Meanwhile, in the middle of this interface is going to be the code area. And this is where Andrew and soon you will drag and drop some of those puzzle pieces and other colors as well and lock them together to get your characters, soon to be. Invented to do something on the screen. Indeed, at the bottom right here, will you see ultimately? A sprite area where a sprite is a technical term for like a character in a video game or a programming environment like this. By default, historically, Scratch、uh, is the cat, the mascot, if you will, for this programming environment. And so here we see by default just one sprite selected because on the top right of the screen is the stage for that sprite. And you can click, it, click and zoom in to make it full screen, but this is the world in which Scratch, by default, the cat will live. But you can change Scratch's costume so that it looks like a singer or a man falling from. From the sky or the like, or anything else, either creating the art yourself or importing some of the things that come with it or elsewhere online. So, what is this world that Scratch rather lives in? Well, generally speaking, we won't have to care too much about numbers because we'll be able to ask questions like interactive ones, like is Scratch the cat or any character otherwise, touching the edge of the screen, touching something else. But Scratch does exist in this two dimensional. A coordinate system world. So when the cat or any character is dead center in the middle, that would be xy location 0, 0, if you will. Meanwhile, over here is 240 pixels or dots all the way to the right. So this would be 240, 0, where y is 0 because it's right on that midline. So it's neither up or below. Over here to the left, of course, would be negative 240 and 0. Above the cat would be x equals 0 because it's right on that vertical midline and 180. And then Down here, as you might guess, would be 0, negative 180. Generally speaking, we don't have to care about those precise pixel coordinates, but it's helpful ultimately if you do want the cat to move up, down, left, or right, having some sense of direction according to the x axis and y axis as well can help you express your ideas ultimately. So, what might some of those ideas be? Well, let's do this. Let me go ahead and in just a moment, give me a moment to open up a window on my screen here. I'm going to go ahead and create. On scratch.mit.edu, just an empty screen like this one here. 
And so this is the exact same interface, but now I'm in my browser,、uh, full screen, so that I can start writing some code. And let's get that cat to say something actually on the screen. Now, this takes a little bit of practice, but honestly, just by scrolling through these puzzle pieces, can you quickly get a sense of what's possible, not just categorically, but specifically? And I'll jump around because I've done this, of course, before, but I'm going to go to events in yellow first, and I'm going to drag and drop this first block called when green flag clicked. And I've zoomed in there just to make it a little more legible. And notice that the shape of this green flag just so happens to mirror this green flag here at top next to this red stop sign of sorts. And the green flag is going to mean go, and the red stop sign is going to mean stop to start or stop our program. Next week, you're going to be writing a textual command at your keyboard to do the exact same idea, but for now, it's a button. So when green flag clicked, what do I want Scratch to do? Well, how about we have Scratch just initially say something like hello world, which indeed historically is the first program that most any programmer might write. So anything related to what the cat looks like it's doing is actually going to be under looks here in purple. So I'm going to drag over say hello, and you'll notice something curious and different about this purple block. It says, of course, say in purple, but then there's this white oval and some text that by default is hello, because MIT just decided that by default the placeholder will be hello. But anytime you see this white oval, it's an opportunity to provide an input into the function called say. And so here I'm borrowing terminology from before. Problem solving, again, is all about inputs, producing outputs, and in between there is some algorithm. In a moment, we're going to start referring to algorithms quite frequently as. Functions. Why? Because it's the implementation of some algorithm. So let me override the default with hello, comma, world. I'll zoom out. And now, if I go to the top right of the screen and click the green flag, we'll see, hopefully, my very first program in code. Now, it wasn't a huge lift, right? It only was a matter of dragging and dropping puzzle pieces. But what has now happened? Well, it turns out that two things have happened. When I, the human, Clicked on that green flag, I triggered what we're going to start calling now an event. An event is generally something graphical or interactive that just happens in a computer program. You and I trigger events on our phones all day long. Whenever you tap or drag or long press or pinch or any of those gestures in vogue nowadays on phones, you are triggering events. And people at Apple and Google and elsewhere have written code that listen for those events and do something when that event happens. That's what I just did. When green flag is clicked, I want something to happen. Namely, I want this purple function, this verb, this action called say, to do something. What do I want it to do? I want it to say what this input is. And I'm going to introduce another vocabulary term. The white ovals here are, yes, inputs very generically, but in a programmer's terminology, they're called arguments, otherwise known as parameters. And that just means an input to a function that modifies its behavior in some way. When I click stop, that's just another event, and that one is just built into Scratch. Scratch knows that when you click the green stop sign,、uh, everything should just stop automatically. I don't have to write code to support that feature. So that's all fine and good. Hello, world. But if I keep doing Stop and start and stop and start, it's going to do the same thing again and again. And it's really not that interesting at the end of the day. It may be gratifying once, but it'd be nice if this were a little more interactive. So it turns out that we can do that too, but we need a different mental model instead. So in this case here, when we think about this function say in this input hello world, this actually maps pretty cleanly to this model earlier that I propose is problem solving, is computer science, if you will. The input To the current problem is going to be in white here, hello world. The algorithm is the say algorithm. Now, I don't know how MIT got it to print out the little pretty speech bubble on the screen, but they wrote those underlying low level implementation details and they gave me and you a purple function called say that just does that for you. You and I don't have to reinvent that wheel. The output of say is another technical term now called a side effect. A side effect is usually something visual that happens, like as a side effect of you calling a function. And so the side effect here is that the cat has this speech bubble magically appear inside of which is hello world. So we have an input, we have an output, we have an algorithm, but now we're talking about these ideas in the context of programming. So now the input is an argument, the algorithm is a function, and the output in this case is a side effect. Terminology that you'll just hear more and more, and it'll eventually. Sink in, but not to worry if the terminology doesn't come naturally early on. So, what more might I do with this? 
But let me go back to scratch here and make this maybe perhaps more interactive and actually get the cat to say something a little more dynamically. So instead of hello world, why don't I get it to say hello to me or to you or anyone else? So let me do this. Let me go under, say,、uh, let me get rid of this first. And you'll notice this neat trick. As soon as you start dragging on a block, if it gets close to it, it kind of goes gray and it can be magnetically snapped together. You don't have to do it very precisely. Conversely, if I want to get rid of a puzzle piece, I can just drag it anywhere on the left, let go, and that deletes it. Or you can right click or control click, and a little menu will let you delete it as well. Well, let me do this instead. Under sensing, which I know is there because I've done this before, are a whole bunch of things related to sensing, whereby the cat can kind of feel out its world in some sense. It can do things like ask this question Am I touching the mouse pointer, like the user's cursor? Am I touching a specific color that you can override to be anything you want? Is the distance to the mouse pointer some specific value? But for now, I'm going to focus this on this this blue puzzle piece that asks a question, which itself is this white oval that I can apparently change, and then it's going to wait for a response. But this puzzle piece is a little different. It's a little special. It comes with a freebie. It comes with what we're going to call technically a return value. So some functions don't just do something on the screen, they hand you back, so to speak, a value that you can do anything that you want with. Nothing happens immediately unless you do something with that so called return value. So let me go ahead and drag this thing over here. Ask, what's your name? And I'll use the default question. That seems a reasonable place to start. I'm not going to override that default. And now let me go ahead and zoom out. Let me go back to looks. Let me go to say, and let me just form the English sentence I want. So let me zoom in here and type in hello, maybe comma, space. I could do David, but that's, that's obviously not right because I'm asking for a name and then I'm like in advance hard coding my name. That's not what I want. I just want hello, comma. And now let me zoom out and grab one more say block. Let me maybe say here. OK, I don't want to say hello, hello. I, I don't want to just type in my own name because, again, then what's the point of asking the user for their name? But notice this. If I go back to the sensing block, this is where that oval that's blue called answer is useful. This will be the so called return value of that function. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this and drag and drop. Even though it's not the right size, it is the right shape. And so Scratch will be smart about it and grow to fill that puzzle piece for you. Let me zoom out now. And now let me click the green flag. You'll see that Scratch is indeed prompting me with the speech bubble. What's your name? Notice the little text box below the cat is asking, What's your name? So I'm going to type in D A V I D and hit enter, or I can click the blue check. Enter. OK, it's a little weird. I wanted him to say hello, not just my name. So let me stop. Let me start it again. All right, hello, what's your name? D A V I D. Enter. Huh, kind of rude.、Uh, why is there this bug? Like, I wanted to say hello, David, not just David, and yet twice it has failed to do so.、Uh, yeah. Yeah, the computer's processing my directions, my actions really quickly. And so it actually is doing it. It's just you and I in the room are just way too slow to notice that it said, Hello, David. It just seems to have just said David. So, all right, how can I fix this? Well, here's where you start to poke around and think about how you might solve this. Let me go back under looks. Maybe there's a smarter way to do this. Maybe I could do, OK, I could do this. How about instead of just say hello, there's apparently another puzzle piece where I can time it. So I can maybe slow things down a little bit. So let me do this. Let me throw away all of this. Let me drag a say hello for two seconds. Let me drag another say hello for two seconds. Let me change the first one to indeed hello, comma. And then let me go back to sensing. Let me grab that same answer because I threw it away a second ago and I'll just change it. I don't even have to delete hello. I can just overwrite it like this. So now I think we'll kind of pump the brakes and see things more slowly. Let me stop. Let me start. D A V I D, enter. Hello, David. OK, so it's better. Like it seems to be working. I think your hypothesis was right.、It、just looks kind of stupid, right? Like the fact that it's saying hello. David, like we can do better. And like literally every piece of software on your phone or Mac or PC is better than that. It adds words together in the user interfaces you and I are familiar with. So let's go a little more fishing here. Let me throw away these. Let me go back to looks and just get the simpler say. I want this to say hello, comma, 
name, where name comes from that answer return value. So, how can I do this? Well, let me go under operations, which we haven't been before. There's a lot of stuff in here. Some of it's mathematically related, adding, subtracting, and so forth. You can generate random numbers, which might be useful. And if I keep scrolling down, there's this join apple and banana. But that's just placeholder text. You can join one piece of text with another piece of text. By default, apple and banana, but let's change it to hello and my name. So, this too, wrong size, but right shape. So, let me let it snap into place. Let me go ahead now and do hello, comma. And now I think I just want to go grab that answer return value. Let me drag the same oval as before, clobber, that is overwrite banana. So, now I'm kind of composing functions. The output of one function, join, is going to be the input of another function. Say. So let's see what happens now that they're kind of stacked on top of each other or nested, so to speak. Click the green arrow, a green flag, D A V I D, enter. Hello, David. All right, that was pretty fast. Let's just, just do it once more. Stop, start. Here we go, D A V I D, enter. OK. Right, it's not the most exciting program in the world, but it's more correct. It's better designed just because that's what you would kind of expect the software to do and not be some kind of lame user interface that's just inserting random delays to just make it kind of work. Like that's a workaround, a hack, if you will. But there's some cool things you can do with Scratch. And we won't really go down the rabbit hole of all of the fun and family friendly features that it has.